Greetings from Fintech TV and this week's episode of Dangerous Women Leading Onward. I'm Pat Mitchell, and today's guest is one of the world's most admired and accomplished women leaders. Her journey from a close-knit traditional Indian family to the top job at one of the U.S.'s most iconic companies, chairman and CEO of PepsiCo. It's a compelling, powerful story of courage, hard work, challenges, and lessons learned. And you can read it all in this must-read, remarkable memoir, My Life in Full. Please welcome Indra Nui. Thank you for having me, Pat. It's a privilege and a pleasure to talk with you. Indra, your life is an inspiring and informative business story, certainly compelling examples all the way through of the challenges you faced as a woman of color and as an immigrant, steadily working, and working is the operative word in your career. You Mm -hmm. overcame so many barriers and stereotypes. But the book is also an important reflection on the challenges for women and families of working women, in particular, to have it all while doing it all. So people look at your life in full and say, Indra Nui, you have done it all. What was the role that family played in your doing it all and having it all? Mm. Great question, Pat, thank you. Um, You know, people can look at me and say, you did have it all, whatever have it all means. Because I stayed married for 41 years, still married to the same person. I have two lovely daughters, managed to keep a career and then ascend to becoming CEO. And uh, somehow survived through it without going insane through it all. So people might look at me and say, boy, she had it all. But what people don't know behind the scenes is how I was able to do it all. One, family was critically important. I had a very supportive spouse and an extended family who said, you should dream big, do whatever you want, and we'll support you. I had mentors along the way. At every point in time, I had spectacular people, all white men, I must say, who stepped up and said, we want to mentor you. We want to support you. We want to promote you. And so they played a gigantic role in my ascension to the top. But then there was my own uh, efforts too. I don't sleep much. So I basically got three or four extra hours in a day to do the job I had to, so I could be more productive. Uh, I, I speed read and I have a pretty decent memory power. So I think the combination of these unique personal characteristics I had, plus the mentors and the family support, all contributed in my being able to squeeze a lot more out of the day. But this doesn't mean that I had balance. The word balance did not exist in my vocabulary. It just meant I juggled more issues more deftly. That's all it means. Because being a CEO is three full-time jobs. Being an executive is a full-time job. Being a mom is a full-time job. Being a daughter, wife are all full-time jobs. So you're taking multiple full-time jobs and trying to compress it down to a 24-hour day. It's still 24 hours in the day. So it's a question of constantly juggling. What am I going to be in this hour, in the next hour? And if you can somehow juggle this thing deftly, you can survive. And that's what I did. It's like the duck, you know, floating on the water very calmly, but underneath the water, it's sort of, fiercely uh, peddling. That's what I was doing. (laughs) Well, that describes every woman I know. As a matter of fact, what what I'm inspired by is at this point in your life, that's plenty to have accomplished. That's plenty of juggling for a lifetime, right? But you have chosen to take up the very core challenge of making it easier and better for other women and working families all over the world to have what they want in terms of their dreams and aspirations, but what they also want as wives and partners and mothers. Why is that so difficult? And how do we make the case, which you are doing, about how essential this is? Well, you know, when I stepped down from PepsiCo, a lot of young women and family builders basically approached me and said, is there a manual for how to do it all? As if I had a manual. And That was one side. And then the other side was people saying, why won't you replace by a woman as a CEO of PepsiCo? Interestingly, they don't ask the men this question, but they asked me as a female, why won't you replace by a woman? 
But this caused me to stop and think about what do we need to do to develop people to reach the top of a company? And then how do we make sure that people are not so stressed out in balancing work, family, you know, juggling all these opportunities? But I thought perhaps I'd write a series of articles on how to help women ascend and um, also uh, enable them to create a family. And um, as I started writing these policy papers, people came to me and said, these papers will only have credibility if you inform it with your life story. That's what caused the book to be written. And as I was writing the book, five major themes sort of sprung out at me. The first is families are the root of everything we do. Families are important and we need the children because any economy needs young people to grow and we need the young people to care for us in our old age and to pay into social security and keep that virtuous circle going. So we need to emphasize families. We need to make sure people can, you know, have the energy and the ability to create families. Second, women are critical to creating families. Without women, we don't have families. We don't have family creation. At the same time, many of the jobs of the future require women in the paid workforce. And women today are so wicked smart. They're getting all the top grades. They're getting disproportionate number of degrees, even in the STEM disciplines that as a country, if we want to succeed, we need to make sure we tap into the brilliance of women for us to thrive as a country. It's a competitive advantage issue. So we need to tap into women. So we need women to have families. Families are important. And we also need women to be in the paid workforce, which brings me to the third one. The economy today needs women. We have got a shortage of talent and shortage of labor. We need everybody who can work to work in the economy. And we need to create an environment where they can bring their best selves to work and contribute maximum. And today, it's a bigger challenge than ever before. The fourth is we throw every roadblock in the way to, for women. In the workplace, it's bias. We don't give them equal pay for equal work. And at home, you want to create families, they don't have a support structure. Uh, you know, it's, it's like, hurdle after hurdle, headwind after headwind that women have to face. And so they just give up. They're saying, let me quit my job coming out of the pandemic, or let me not have kids at all. Let me delay having kids, or better still not have kids at all. None of these options are good. So my big aha from this whole thing is, it's high time. We removed every one of these barriers systematically. Within companies, let's address bias once and for all. Let's think about pay parity in an aggressive uh, way to make sure that we don't have to wait years to get to pay parity. And then when it comes to a support structure, let's look at the trifecta, paid leave, workplace flexibility, and care. The pandemic has opened the door to remote work and workplace flexibility. Let's have paid leave and a wonderful care network. And pretty soon, I think we would have created all the conditions for family creation. And we will make women use, look at families as a source of strength, not a source of stress, which is really where we want to get to, because then you can have families and also engage in paid work. And that is really what this book is about. It's a book about, we can do it. We have a formula, we have a roadmap, let's figure out a way to do it. And the book is so powerful for the reason, exactly those reasons, what you just enumerated uh, in the themes, there are examples of how it played out in your life and plays out in the lives of others and what can be done. It's not as if there aren't solutions to the challenges you mentioned and where these solutions are implemented, there are healthier families and healthier economies. The, the numbers tell the story Andra, so I find myself mystified again and again, not to mention frustrated uh, by the fact that we can't move forward on these very clear policy changes needed in business and government. I what agree with you, Pat, and I think that it cannot be government doing it or private sector doing it or families doing it on their own. I think everybody has to come together and say, how can we work together to create a system that works for people. It could be a whole range of options for care. We're not mandating anything. We're just providing a menu of options. 
And so I think the time has come for us to stop talking about what can be done to moving to how do we create the structure to allow these uh, you know, many choices to be implemented and funded in every community where children are born and they have childcare deserts today. I think the time has come for action. And the actions are there. I mean, we can have subsidized childcare, we can have family leave, and, and we have seen the, the benefits of all of it. And we, we certainly know the performance with purpose pays off. So I mentioned yeah. that very specifically because uh, as anyone who reads a book and anyone who followed your career knows, performance with purpose was the strategy under which you led PepsiCo. There's so much in that thought, performance with purpose. Can you describe a bit more about how that played out uh, and the better policies that were put into place for the environment for families uh, while leading this amazing company? You know, performance with purpose was just the umbrella under which I was operating PepsiCo for all 12 years that I was CEO. In retrospect, it feels like the most logical, simple direction for the company that should have had more supporters than detractors, yet I had enough detractors. So in its core, it was PepsiCo is a high performance company. We're going to remain a high performance company. But as I looked at the future trends and worked backwards to ensure a successful company well into the future, we had to invest to make sure that we made our products healthier because the consumer was moving to more health and wellness. We had to make sure that the environmental footprint of our business was minimized using less water in our operations, uh, you know, reducing the carbon footprint, making sure our plastic was recycled. And finally, we had to make sure that we created an environment in PepsiCo where everybody could bring their whole self to work. So we said performance is performance, but purpose is gonna have three legs. Human sustainability. We wanted to nourish our consumers with treats and healthy eats. So we wanted them to have great tasting, affordable, available, healthy products. We wanted to replenish the environment. So we did not feel like we were adding too much cost to society. And then the third plank was we wanted to cherish our employees. We wanted each employee to feel like they were special, company welcomed them, and didn't just look at them as a pair of hands, but looked at them as a true asset to the company. So taken together, if you didn't invest in purpose, you couldn't deliver performance. If you didn't deliver performance, you couldn't invest in purpose. So the two are self-reinforcing. And it was not about giving away the money we made. We were fundamentally changing the way we made money. And it seems like the most logical thing was, had we not transformed our portfolio, we would have had a lot of pushback. Had we not focused on environmental sustainability, we would have lost a license to operate in society. And had we not created a good environment in the company, we couldn't hire the best and the brightest. So they sound and are in reality simple approaches to running a good company. Instead, you know, well-meaning people criticized me quite a bit initially and then came around to saying, I understand what you're doing. This is the only way to do it. Well, you were making good by doing good, you know, oh, sort of exactly one right. of the old axioms. And there were measurable results, which is why it is, again, a bit frustrating when these measurable outcomes, which are positive, still have those who say, oh, but we have to do it the old way. Much more on the impact when we come back. Welcome to FinTech TV, a global media platform for digital assets and sustainable investing. My name is Kavita Gupta. And I'm Vince Molinari, and we are so pleased to be back at the New York Stock Exchange. Our signature shows the Digital Asset Report, focused on the global ecosystem of blockchain, digital assets, financial tech evolution, and the impact. A show focused on credible social entrepreneurs, impact investors, 
we reach 850 million households globally. This is FinTech TV. How did you handle those moments when there was skepticism and criticism? Um, let's talk about those first. And then I want to mention a couple of other barriers that probably some of the young business leaders listening to us today are thinking about. I think the singular, singularly most important piece of work I did was something called a future back memo, mega trends memo. Looked at where the world was going in the next decade or two. And our business, where could it end up in the next decade or two? if we didn't uh, address those issues. And based on these mega trends, work backwards and said, these are the actions we need to take, very specific actions. And then socialize that document to the board. Very important because the board's my boss. So I spent two or three hours with each board member, took them through this document, they bought into it, they gave me their comments. And based on this blueprint, we started to reposition the company and pivoted into a new way. Every time there was a critic of the company and my direction, I would ask them questions like the following. I'd say, do you believe consumers are moving towards eating and drinking healthier products? Oh yeah, they are. Even I've changed my eating and drinking habits. So why do you think we shouldn't change? So you always start with a global trend and then come back to our strategy. So my point to people was the following. I said, if you disagree with the global trend, then let's talk about it. But if you agree with the global trend, then tell me if my strategy is wrong. If the global trend and the strategy are right, what are we arguing about? So we had this true north to fall back on. And that to me was very important because it helped us deflect a lot of criticism and it helped the board stand up and say, we support our CEO because this is the right way to run the company. So in a nutshell, CEO should run the company for the duration of the company, not the duration of the CEO. I wanted PepsiCo to be successful well into the future, not just for the few years that I was CEO. So I had to think future back. And I had to balance level and duration of returns. You know, I don't have to deliver extraordinary returns that goes flat. You know, I wanted to make sure there was a good level of returns that would last for a long time. So balancing this level and duration of returns was a very interesting balancing act, but it's something that every CEO should do as opposed to pedal to the metal for five to seven years and then get the hell out. I think that's a terrible value destruction strategy. Given that women are leaving the workforce, the pandemic highlighted all of these challenges we talked about earlier. What do you see as the way forward for strengthening a pipeline of women prepared uh, to step into their power and take leadership? I think the first of all, we need the women. We need the women in the workforce because they are so smart. They're so driven. They're getting all the top grades. Uh, and all the statistics we see are said that say that companies perform better when you have more women in the senior ranks, on the board, in critical positions. So if we want to be a highly productive, highly competitive nation, we need to tap into all the talent, and that includes women. Okay, so the first message to women is we need you. All right, that's the first one. Second, we also need you to have families, please. We need kids. So when we're giving them these two big challenges, I want to be able to say the third thing, which is guess what? We're going to support you. Okay. We need you. You're brilliant. You're smart. We're going to remove the barriers in your way and we're going to support you. And that requires men who today hold all the seats of power to come to the table. I think the biggest change that has to happen going forward is men have to come to the table to say, how are we going to raise these kids so that women can do all of this without feeling totally stressed out and then dropping out of the workforce. Because the only other way to fill the gap is through massive immigration, which is a, something we've deployed as a country very intelligently. But in today's world, why not first ask the question, how about deploying all US-based talent for the benefit of the country? 
So I think with simple support mechanisms, with simple ways of removing the barriers inside companies, we can actually bring women into the workforce in large numbers. Somebody once said to me that the largest emerging market opportunity in the United States is women. Just think about it. The large, large, largest emerging market opportunity in the US is women. And I think that's probably true worldwide in many countries too. Yeah, very and true. So when we, the numbers tell the story, we know the need is great to uh, strengthen the global economy. And you have made the case so brilliantly for how that is not going to happen for women until we provide the kind of support systems. It'll happen because there'll be exceptions like Indra Nui who, mm-hmm. and others who balance it all, but or juggle it all. But it should be easier. So is there... It, is there advice or are there specific steps our audience might take now to prioritize the needs of families and creating these support systems that we know will strengthen family and the economy? I think one has to happen within families, the second within governments and communities and companies. Within families, I think there's got to be a conversation between the husband and wife that they're going to share the load. It can't all be on the backs of the woman. And I think you know, if it's possible, figure out how the family can you know, really commit to some intergenerational responsibility to help out the young people. I think you know, somebody once said it takes a village to raise a kid. I fully agree that it takes a village to raise a kid. We need to create those villages. And I think on the flip side, Governments, companies, communities, NGOs all have to come together and say, let us provide a support structure to help young women realize their hopes and dreams. I mean, I think of nurses through the pandemic. Many young nurses, many, almost all of them women, had young kids at home. They had no predictability in work hours. They came to work sometimes, they had to stay there for a week in the hospital because they couldn't go out for reasons uh, to do with quarantine. Who was taking care of the kids? Childcare centers were shut. Did we even stop and ask ourselves, how is the frontline gonna handle all of these challenges? We just assume that if you have a kid, it's your responsibility. If there are problems with childcare, whatever, it's your responsibility. That's not how it works because we want productive kids. We want kids that will contribute to the country, which means that we have to nurture them develop them, but do it in a way that we get the benefit of group tutoring, you know, group development. I mean, it's like saying, Pat, when a kid reaches five, we say that their education is, it's a responsibility of the state and the government. Somehow between zero and five, we're saying it's a responsibility of the family. So I think we have to creep some of that into a joint responsibility of community, state, corporations, government, whatever. Some work to do. There's work to do. And you outline many of the very uh, specific ways in which we as citizens of countries all over the world, the way we can contribute to creating this kind of global workforce. Mm -hmm. Andrea, we also need models. And you are a model of what can be awesomely accomplished by a woman who is both an economist and a feminist, (laughs) whose story uh, bears witness to the importance of a diverse and inclusive economy and to the prioritization of family needs within businesses, governments, and communities. Thank you, Andrew. Thank Thank you, you, Pat. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Your life in full and all the ways that you have led onward to a more sustainable, just, and equitable future. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it.